even after retirement, these guys couldn't stay away from their sports. Ditka was different. He was kick-ass at the podium and on the field. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 athletes turned coaches. The NBA named him one of the 50 greatest players and 10 greatest coaches. He's the only man named to both lists. For this list, we're looking to those coaches who started their sporting careers playing the game they came to manage. Those athletes who proved successful on both sides of the bench in terms of games and trophies won will rank higher. But that means we're excluding those who had great playing careers, but who failed to recapture the magic as a coach. Hi, I'm Jimmy Connors, and let me tell you a little bit about my app. It's like having me, your own personal tennis pro, right at your fingertips. Number 10, Bill Russell. This award will henceforth be named for Bill Russell, a true legend of the game. A basketball player whose skills are matched by few others. This longtime Boston Celtic center was smart enough when it came to his chosen sport to take on coaching responsibilities for his team towards the end of his playing career. And he was hardly a stopgap coach either. During his three-year spell as player coach, he won two more NBA championships to take his overall tally to 11. After losing the Eastern Division Finals in his first season as player coach, Bill Russell led a resurgence. The Celtics won back-to-back -back titles in 1968 and 69. The Boston Celtics have done it again. After leaving the Celtics, his coaching career never really took off, but he will forever be remembered for his contribution to one of the great basketball dynasties and for becoming the first African-American head coach in NBA history. The only reason I would do it is because I'm convinced that I'm the best person for the job. Number nine, Pep Guardiola. I am a trainer in a big club, and uh, we have to play for respect for uh, his history. The Spaniard grew up learning the ethos and playing style of FC Barcelona, so his transition from player to manager was seamless. He conducts his team like an orchestra, with body, soul, and a dash of Spanish spontaneity. As a manager, he was successful in his first season, with Barcelona winning a treble that consisted of a La Liga title, the Copa del Rey, and the UEFA Champions League. Pep effortlessly turned the club into the biggest force in the world game. His teams usually play attacking football that allows players the freedom to express themselves because he always has a solid defensive midfield anchor. You have to try to say aggressive without the ball. And with the ball, we try to play quickly, but, uh, but in the right moment to make to make in the, you know, you have the right players to make the, the change the rhythm. Guardiola's move from Bayern Munich to Manchester City received a lot of hype. And it's no wonder with the success he's brought all his teams. It's easier when the results are good. Number eight, Kenny Dalglish. And Dalglish has made space for himself. And tried to call it and does. Beginning his playing career in 1971, King Kenny went on to play for Liverpool during one of the club's most successful eras. Kenneth Matheson Dalglish is one of those heroes, a footballer known to many simply as the King. It was during that time that he started his managerial career as well, becoming player manager in 1985. It was a great compliment to be asked to become manager. And if they had the belief in myself, then it was only right that I should try and support that belief. Dropping the grittier style of play for a tighter pass and move game, he helped the Reds take home three more First Division titles and two FA Cups before he moved on in 1991. And in May 1990, his last ever playing appearance saw Liverpool presented with yet another league title. Nine months later, though, Dalglish resigned. However, arguably his greatest managerial success was taking Blackburn Rovers to the Premier League title. The club had nowhere near the same profile as other huge English teams, and yet he still managed to take his group of mainly homegrown players to the top of English football. We deserve it, and when we finish above a team, they're the quality of Manchester United, Notch Forest, Newcastle, uh, Liverpool, and it's been a magnificent achievement. Number seven, Joe Torrey. What a manager really should get satisfaction from is if he's getting the most out of somebody's ability. There's barely a role in baseball that this legend hasn't taken on. Beginning in 1960 with the Milwaukee Braves, where he played catcher, first and third base, Torrey then moved around to different teams like the Mets, where he served as player manager for a total of 18 days before retiring to focus on his coaching duties. He drifted around to a couple of other clubs and had
had a short spell in commentary before he used his unparalleled ability to communicate with players to guide the Yankees to considerable success at the end of the 20th century. Torrey's Yankees won four World Series titles during his 12-season tenure and cemented his rightful place in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Since my election to the Hall of Fame, um, yeah, you carry yourself a little differently. Number six, Mike Ditka. In the late 50s, a bigger, fiercer strain of cat appeared in a Panther uniform. Affectionately known as Iron Mike, Ditka is a straight shooter who's one of only two men to have won the Super Bowl as a player, assistant coach, and coach. We gotta pick each other up, come on. Let's just roll after him as hard as you can. Known to inspire his troops with his fiery attitude, Ditka's is a legendary name in Chicago Bears lore, as his championship wins as a player and head coach were won for that franchise. Under this former tight end's leadership, the Bears were a major force throughout the 1980s, as Ditka himself picked up both the AP and UPI Coach of the Year awards in 1985 and 88. Ditka remade the Bears in his image, tough-nosed players who didn't take crap from anyone. He took on coaching duties with New Orleans in the late 90s, but he never recaptured the magic of the 80s. I would like to put the Bears back into another Super Bowl. Not that I'll do it, but I think the players want to. Yeah. Number five, Jacques Lemaire. Three over, Lemaire has a breakaway. Lemaire shoots, he scores! A brief glance at the career of this longtime Montreal Canadian may suggest that his on-ice days were far more successful than his management. He has eight Stanley Cups as a player and just one as a coach. But coaching success is about more than just winning trophies. Besides being regarded as one of the best tactical coaches ever, he's also created a reputation for bringing up young talent and nurturing them to the top ranks of the NHL. But what I, I hold on a lot is the, the, the group, how they work together, how we gel as a team and how we, we became a championship team. Guiding the New Jersey Devils for seven non-consecutive years, and becoming the first head coach of the Minnesota Wild, Lemaire proved that his love of the neutral zone trap and his somewhat unconventional style were effective. Head coach Jacques Lemaire. Number four, Lenny Wilkins. Lenny Wilkins is a genuine basketball icon. Having learned to play on Brooklyn playgrounds, this New Yorker was as successful on the court as he was on the sidelines. A three-time inductee into the Basketball Hall of Fame, once as a player, once as a coach, and once as an assistant coach of 1992's Olympic Dream Team, Wilkins went to 13 All-Star Games, nine times as a player, and four as a coach. Cool, calm, and collected, Wilkins' style contrasted with more flamboyant coaches and earned players' respect wherever he went. And that not only won him an Olympic gold medal in 1996 for his head coach role with the men's basketball team, it also made him one of the winningest coaches in NBA history. He's one of the best coaches that I've ever played for, really a detailed, uh, structured type of coach. He's, he put the right situations in place for his players, and that comes from being a great player in his own right. Number three, Toe Blake. A stalwart of the Montreal Canadiens for over three decades, Toe Blake was involved in 10 of the storied franchise's 24 Stanley Cup victories. Two of these came when the left winger was the team's captain during the later stages of his distinguished and award-winning playing career. But his other eight wins as the tough but fair Habs coach are considered even more historic. These successes formed the foundation of two of the NHL's most recognized dynasties, one of which included five Stanley Cup wins in a row from 1956 to 1960. The Richard brothers, born 15 years apart, clicked for Montreal's fourth goal against Don Simmons. Sure, the Richard brothers were instrumental in these successes, but Toe Blake's guiding hand was just as crucial. Number two, Franz Beckenbauer. The Kaiser has had success as a player, coach, and club president, has 424 Bundesliga appearances under his belt, and is considered one of the most elegant players of his era. A natural leader on the field, 
who translated that skill to a successful management career after retiring. Der Kaiser is universally regarded as one of the best football players in history. Nicknamed the Kaiser, Franz Beckenbauer was an outstanding talent and remains Germany's most celebrated footballer. One of only two people to have won the FIFA World Cup as a player and manager, Beckenbauer demonstrated versatility and creativity on the pitch, so he was a natural fit to manage once he hung up his cleats. His six-year spell as an international manager of the West German team was his longest coaching stint and it was followed by brief jobs at both Marseille and Bayern Munich. Naturally, he helped secure the league title for both clubs during his short stay. The German public called on him despite his lack of coaching license, but as a player and coach, he always had the license for success. Before we reveal our number one pick, here are some honorable mentions. Yet he won two Super Bowls as head coach of the Oakland slash Los Angeles Raiders. He's got four Super Bowl rings in all. He's one of three men to win a Super Bowl as a player, as an assistant coach, and as a head coach two times. Having coached two international teams to the top of the game, his reputation is enormous. Well, you see what uh, Joe Quentin yeah. thinks. I mean, there's no question the puck's out of play. Yeah. And what is the call going to be? And Joe is gesturing that ball was on the ground. Number one, Phil Jackson. Oh my God, that was real. Real Considered one of the greatest basketball coaches ever, Phil Jackson had already won two NBA championships in his 13 years as a player before he swapped his jersey for a suit. Some people may not understand his methods, but if you've played for him, you, know, you understand him completely and you know what he's about. I mean, he's just absolutely brilliant at bringing a group together to accomplish one common goal. As a coach, Jackson was a devotee of the triangle offense and used that to help build two of the sport's most dominant dynasties, presiding over six championships for the Chicago Bulls and five for the LA Lakers. Dealing with dominant personalities on the court, Jackson never posted a losing season in all his years as a coach. Despite employing an unconventional spiritual approach to his management, the Zen master still has the highest winning percentage of any coach in the Hall of Fame. A winning percentage over 70%, 229 playoff wins, first all time. Do you agree with our list? He wants the cat to be 2-0 instead of 1-1. Which athletes turned coaches impressed you? I won't make any predictions. We'll play the best we can. Anyway, predictions are for gypsies. For more sporting top tens published every day, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. There was hiccups along the way, without a doubt. But as far as, as being willing learners with an open mind, they're, they're very accommodating for me, and I, I'm very gracious and glad about that. Mm -hmm.